Hey everyone, welcome to session 203 of the Behavioral Observations podcast. You know, in the world of behavior analysis, my guest today, Rose Griffin, is a unicorn of sorts. A uh, unicorn being the unofficial mascot of those select few who hold both speech language pathologist and board certified behavior analyst credentials. For 20 years, Rose supported students in public school settings, but these days, she's concentrating on taking all the knowledge she's acquired and sharing it in the form of podcasts, online trainings, courses, and much, much more. In this interview, Rose and I discuss how she got into speech therapy and then behavior analysis, the challenges and benefits of collaboration, the subtleties of joint attention that many behavior analysts miss in our training programs, we talk about our awesome podcast, the Autism Outreach Podcast, and of course, advice for the newly minted. During the interview, we covered a lot of topics, as you just heard, and we mentioned all sorts of resources. So I would encourage you to go to behavioralobservations.com to check out all the links I have there. Just go to session 203. You can also check out Rose's website, abaspeech.org. And speaking of her website, uh, Rose was kind enough to provide listeners with a 30% discount on the uh, on her courses through December 1st, 2022. These courses include the Advanced Language Learner, Help Me Find My Voice, and Start Communicating Today. These are all five-hour CEU courses. Just use the promo code ABA30 at checkout, and you'll be good to go. I also want to add a couple of other footnotes before we get to the interview itself. Uh, first, I... I kind of knew it was a mistake as the words were coming out of my mouth, but I mistakenly noted that Rose was the first SLP BCBA on the show. Uh, that honor actually goes to Dr. Barbara S., who appeared on a panel discussion for the Verbal Behavior Conference, the, so that you'll have to go back a couple of years to find that one, but uh, apologies to the good Dr. Esch. Um, and second, in the spirit of transparency, I want to note that ABAspeech.org will be sponsoring some upcoming episodes, so i just like to mention that, again, in the spirit of disclosure. So uh, last but not least, in uh, speaking of sponsors, I want to let you know that Session 203 is brought to you by the University of Cincinnati Online. UC Online designed a Master's of Education in Behavior Analysis program that is 100% online and asynchronous, meaning you log on when it works for you. If you want to learn more, go to online.uc.edu and click the Request Info button. We're also brought to you by HRIC Recruiting. You've heard about Barb before. Barb Voss has been placing BCBAs in permanent positions across the country for over a decade. And she's been in the recruiting business for over 30 years more generally. She really has her finger on the pulse of our industry. So if you're looking for a job, if you're trying to figure out, you know, if you're going to move or you're about to graduate or, you know, if you just want to know if the grass really is greener on the other side, go to HRIColorado.com and schedule a confidential chat with Barb right away. And last but not least, we're brought to you by Behavior University, and their mission is to provide university-quality professional development to the busy behavior analyst. Learn more about their CEU offerings and uh, RBT trainings, supervision courses, and much, much more over at behavioruniversity.com forward slash observations. All right, that's it for opening remarks. So without any further delay, let's get to this really fun and informative conversation with Rose Griffin. Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now, here's your host, Matt Sicoria. Rose Griffin, thanks for coming on the Behavioral Observations Podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm very excited to be here. Fangirl moment to to be on the podcast and hear your iconic voice. I know that we've kind of become friends the past year, but this is really uh, an honor for me to be on. Oh well, that's very kind of you, uh, and I know you're you've you're got a uh, a very uh, successful podcast uh, yourself. So right back at you. We can get into that uh, later on in the show. Um, again, really excited to have you here. Also, uh, I think you're the f- you might be the first SLP BCBA I've had on the show, uh, and if not, I'm gonna find out who it was and <laughs> apologize to them profusely. But uh, 
as far as I don't know, it's a, I think that's correct. So we'll just roll with it. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we're going to talk about a whole host of things about the, I guess the, the overlapping, uh, the, I guess, Venn diagram of, of, of these two different practices and have you, you've managed to kind of, um, you know, come into expertise in, in both these areas. And so I think it'll be of tremendous value to the audience. So, uh, having said all that again, thanks for coming on. Uh, let's, Get into this the usual way, though. Let's talk about how you first encountered behavior analysis. And maybe, you know, if that was secondary to speech, I'd, I'd like to also hear how you first in- decide you want to be a speech therapist, too. So I'm just kind of curious about how yeah. people fall into the careers they fall into. So you can take that in any order you like. Yeah, absolutely. I became a speech therapist because my mom gave me a career test my senior year. She was a teacher. Both my parents are retired educators and it said speech therapist. And I was like, what's that? I never had speech therapy, didn't know what it was. I shadowed a family friend and I was hooked. I was like, oh man, you can help people. Every day is is joyous and you are seeing the benefit of your work and there's not a whole lot of math involved. And so that was it. I took every single class in order graduated summa cum laude because it's extremely hard to get into graduate school. And then I was I was a speech therapist. And my second year of speech therapy, I worked at the Cleveland Clinic. They have an autism center there, here in Cleveland, Ohio. And it was my first introduction to the science of ABA. And a lot of the students that I was working with engaged in very unsafe problem behavior as a way to navigate their environment. Unfortunately, and I remember working with an 18 year old student who, despite being in speech therapy probably since the time of three and receiving special education in a public school, had absolutely no way to communicate. And he was definitely the type of student who knew exactly what he wanted, but didn't know how to convey that besides using unsafe problem behavior that was a barrier to him accessing the community, accessing school. And I remember being hesitant to to work with him and I observed and then I started working with him and set up an old school now, I think, TechSpeak, which is a static AAC device. And he really loved listening to music. So we started manding and we I showed him gesturally. I was pointing to the button where that would be. And after the third trial, he requested it on his own. And we were listening to old school Garth Brooks and Shania Twain. And, and that was it. I, I saw in that moment and so many others, the power of ABA. And I remember what's so funny, Matt. I remember 20 years ago saying to my coworkers, I want to go places and I want to talk about the science of ABA because it literally transformed not only this student's lives, life, but so many others that I've worked with. And it was ever since then, I was like, okay, what, what's going on here? What is ABA? I need to learn all about it. Because prior to that, I was serving students who I would always say they're not running and jumping and skipping to therapy. It's not like what you mm. think of traditional speech therapy, the students that I was working with in these non-public programs. They had very unsafe problem behavior. And despite being in therapy for years and years and years. And this particular student, he was 18 and he had no way to communicate. And I remember looking at his old speech notes with a coworker and saying, how can this be? How can this be? And it killed my SLP heart to know that this child was in therapy, but that nobody could reach him. And so I really made it my life's work to reach and to help the students who are hard to reach. And that's really how I got onto ABA. That was my autism boot camp, I always say. And so I got married. I moved to Austin, Texas. I started my coursework down there at UNT. And I had Kelly Rich as my supervisor. Oh, who yeah. you, I think you were on a panel for her conference, which oh, I yeah, was yeah. kind of new. Yep, yeah. Yep. yep. Uh, and Central, shout out Central Texas Autism Center Verbal Behavior yeah. Conference. Yes. Awesome, awesome event. So... That ahead, that was yeah, awesome. No, that was awesome that she was just, she was the BCBA in my district that I worked in. And so I was an autism facilitator down there. I did my supervision with her, which was just absolutely amazing. She is a powerhouse, you know, business person, understands ABA. And that introduced me to reading Dr. Mary Barbera's book, hearing Dr. Carbone talk. Uh, hearing Tamara Casper, who is somebody else that really inspires me. She's a fellow SLP BCBA. And I mean, that was it. So now I'm kind of just living my dream, you know, with my platform here at ABA Speech about 
being able to disseminate information every day. That's really kind of my life's work is helping professionals now reach those students who are really hard to help. And the way that I do that specifically is through speech therapy and ABA and the combination of those and how powerful that is for people. Got it. Got it. So I want to rewind that tape a little bit. I want to go back yeah. to your, you know, so you, you're in graduate school, you got out and you, you went to work, well, you said at the Cleveland clinic. So did yes. you, did you have any preconceived notions from the, I guess the speech milieu or the you know, speech therapy culture about ABA? Uh, you know, did, were there any, um, you know, was, was, was there any that you, uh, so yeah, it's, I mean, it's cause it sounds like you were kind of converted pretty, pretty fast <laughs> or not say converted, but you, you, yeah. you, you, um, yeah, saw, saw, saw the, uh, the, the utility of it very quickly. And, you know, I think many folks who are listening to this might have, who interact with speech therapists might have a different experience, you know? And, and so I'm, I, I know some speech therapists personally that, um, uh, you know, have, uh, have been told horror stories about ABA, uh, from, from, right. you know, people in their profession and things like that. So it sounds, any of that, that, uh, that you, you experienced, uh, um, well, it's been so, I feel like I've been doing this so long. Like I've been a SLP and BCBA for 10 years and mm-hmm. I've been a speech therapist for 20. So I do remember one professor who I really loved, loved her classes. She's actually been on my podcast now. I remember her not liking ABA. She didn't come out and say anything that was anti-ABA, but I could just tell by some side comments that she wasn't a big fan. But honestly, other than that, I had absolutely nothing in my brain about ABA. There was no... Now there's such a divide that Actually, last May, I was just really stressed out. I just stepped away from my 20-year school-based gig in May to focus on ABA speech, but I was under a lot of stress and I I had to um I just like had to mute some of the SLP influencers because now there is a very big divide of people that are on board with using applied behavior analysis and people who are just very anti-ABA. And I feel so sad about that and upset and angry. But at the time, there really wasn't as much of a divide, I didn't think. So I really didn't have any preconceived ideas. I was just like, wow, look at this kid. He's 18. He's never communicated. He's been in speech therapy for 16 years. This is it. I'm, I'm going here. This is what I'm doing. Hey, everyone. Just going to take a real quick break here and let you know about Behavior University. You know, I'm just looking at their upcoming webinars. They have some cool things coming up. They've got leveraging social media to expand your impact in applied behavior analysis, and that's uh, that's going to be presented by my friend Ryan O'Donnell. Um, let's see the other type of conditioning: ABA applications for health and fitness, and that's presented by Dr. Bobby Newman. And there's a there's many more. So as you can just hear from those two examples, there's a wide variety of topics. And uh, there's lots of cool stuff. So if you want to see more about what they have to offer, go to BehaviorUniversity.com and just kind of look around. And uh, go to BehaviorUniversity.com forward slash observations for a coupon code for podcast listeners. All right, let's get back to this conversation with Rose. I see. Do you do you think that uh, the availability of social media and like this this developing influencer class of professionals, you know, and the Again, here we are talking about this as kind of like, you know, maybe <laughs> looking in the mirror in some respects, but um, as, as much as I dislike that term, but you know, do, do you think that there's, there's, that is uh, perhaps is contributing to that, that, you know, if you have a platform and you've got yeah. your tribe and you've got, you know, mm-hmm. your, 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 you know, this, I don't know, I sometimes wonder that there's this audience capture that happens with, uh, you know, with, with people that, that. Yeah. makes these walls higher and thicker as opposed to oh yeah th- thinner and and, and uh, shorter. Absolutely. And I think that people are on social media looking for answers. I think what really hurts me is that there's so many children that might not get services, ABA services. Now, not everybody's on social media, but there are definitely parents that might be asking questions in a Facebook group or going to Instagram, and they may see something that is not in favor of ABA. And then they may think, well, maybe this isn't what's best for my child. Not everybody is like that. And I, most of the people that I'm friends with in real life, they're not on Instagram. They don't know anybody that I'm on Instagram. They just know I have an online business and I make funny TikToks, but they don't really follow any of these people 
they just don't. So there's a whole host of people. I feel like sometimes we get skewed because I'm on Instagram and TikTok every single day. So I feel like everybody probably is seeing that content, uh, but most people I don't think are, <laughs> you I, know, I that's those, just... I think, I think those people are called normies. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like very skewed in my like thought okay. process. All right. Right? Fair yeah. enough. Fair enough. You know, I sometimes have the same point of view with like problem behavior, you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. uh, when when you get when you get called in to help with situations where where that's you know sometimes you think well that's just kind of like uh the you know no the norm I guess but uh, right. anyway um all right I, uh, I I appreciate you speculating on that so I'm just getting just curiosity so yeah. um so I'm glad glad you were able to come in, into the field uh, with a, a je- objective or or a, at the very least a neutral set of eyes um, yeah so. Um, you know, I, I think some of the things, you know, I mean, uh, you know, is, is as powerful as ABA is, obviously, is there are plenty of times where we don't put our best foot forward. We could do many podcasts on that. And that's not really <laughs> necessarily the, I, I only bring that up to mention that, you know, there's a lot of things that, that sometimes um, behavior analysts, well, let me just, I guess, rephrase the question here. Uh, so like, there's got to be a lot of things that you know, we were chatting before I hit the record button about, you know, things I had to learn in order to be a more effective behavior analyst, uh, because my background was, you know, more about, you know, severe problem behavior, not sorry, you know, the teaching of verbal operants, not, you know, and so like even terms Mm -hmm. like, um, you know, receptive expressive identification and things like that, you know, I, you know, I kind of had to learn those things through supervision and whatnot. And again, my experience in behavior analysis is a little different than most people's now because mm-hmm. it was uh, I was coming from an experimental psychology program where we weren't really focused on those sorts of things. But all that to say is that, you know, w- there's, when it comes to communicating more generally, um, w- w- what are some things that you're seeing? What are, what are some skills that, I guess, what are some things that behavior analysts get wrong that you see, I suppose, or what are some areas that, uh, um, where we might say that we're, we have expertise in and when reality, there's a lot more to learn, I suppose, you know, uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. I think one thing that I think is missing in our coursework in general is understanding typical language development as BCBAs. So speech therapists, we take a lot of courses about, well, when does this usually happen for a student? When does a child usually say their first word? How how much is a student communicating it to? And when do you start using present progressive, you know, actions and prepositions and all those things? And I think that I was talking to some other fellow BCBAs that I think that BCBAs can do a, a good, really good job with communication intervention programming. I think when it gets difficult is when a student is saying more words. So you know, how do we plan for that language development? I think just what SLPs have is such a um, in-depth coursework on some of those things. And also in speech, you know, we take a whole class on how do we make the every different sound and how do they go together and what happens when other sounds are by those sounds. And I think it's, you know, we as I love the VB map, Dr. Sundberg is great. And, you know, the ESA is a part of that, the ECOC assessment created by Dr. Barbara Ash, who is a SLP BCBAD. I think sometimes if we don't have access to an SLP, which I realize a lot of people don't, that it can be really hard to program for some of those things. And so it's not that we're getting it wrong. It's just that I don't think we have as much of a background in some of those things that we're tasked to do in our daily work as BCBAs. Yeah, you know, I... I, I... I couldn't, I couldn't agree more, you know, especially when you start thinking about things like, uh, like grammar and syntax and, and, and those sorts of things, right. uh, along with the other things that you mentioned, it's just, you know, the, 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 that's certainly not it, uh, something that we spend a, a lot of time on to the extent that time is spent on it at all. Um, you could say the same thing for developmental psychology more generally. Mm-hmm. Uh, I suppose that's another thing I think that, uh, would be helpful. Everyone's just going to take a real quick break here and remind you to check out hricolorado.com if you have any questions about employment in the field of behavior analysis. Barb Voss has her finger on the pulse of our field. She knows it like the back of her hand. She knows who's hiring. She knows what appropriate salaries are. Oh, did I have, do I have your attention now? Uh, she is oh, just a wealth of knowledge. Uh, she's been doing this in the field of behavior analysis for 
I think, over a decade now. And she's been a recruiter more generally for over 30 years. She really knows what she's doing. So if you're moving, if you are about to graduate, uh, or if you just kind of want to see what else is out there, go to hricolorado.com and schedule a confidential chat with Barb right away. All right, let's get back to this conversation with Rose. So based on that, what, what um, are there... Um, what, what, I, know, I know you've got, uh, you know, your own set of resources and things like mm-hmm. that. And what we'll do yeah. is we'll direct the audience to your, your podcast, uh, and, um, other, other things, but I'm just trying to think more generally, like if, if there's someone listening to this right now, uh, who's like, you know what, I, I do have kind of holes in that area in my, of, of my repertoire. And I know the individuals I work with would be better served if I, you know, ha- mm-hmm. had more knowledge in this area. Yeah. Um, are, are, are there some, you know, books or readings or just a general uh, content, you know, air, content of whatever, you know, media, mm-hmm. whatever, you know, type that you would yeah. direct people towards to get more up to speed on some of these issues that we don't really get great training on in our coursework and supervision. Yeah. Yeah. We absolutely go over them in our ACE courses. The other thing, um, I actually just got the latest edition for my, um, most recent course I put together called the advanced language learner, but it's language development and introduction by Robert E. Owens Jr. And that is the book that I used for my language course. And it was really interesting about, you know, there's different theories on how we acquire language and, you know, when are different milestones hit. And obviously we know, especially with all students, everything is individualized. And, you know, some kids, if, you know, especially if you're looking at the VB map or something, some kids may have splinter skills in different areas, but that's definitely a very comprehensive book. That's going to give you milestones and just gives you some information about, oh, this is when this may happen. Another website is Asha. Dot org is our, I think it's dot org is our national uh, organization for speech therapists. And there are just some really good kind of milestone information on there that are geared towards the public that might even be nice for you to kind of look at and also to maybe even give to parents too, because I know parents are very, very concerned about when is their child not going to start communicating and when are they going to start talking, which it's all about total communication, but that can be really hard for parents and they may just not know about those resources. So that might be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. I want to come back to that book in just a second, mm-hmm. um, but uh, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, give a shout out to uh, here in New Hampshire, the, uh, I think it's the new UNH cooperative extension. So when, when, when uh, our kids were, were, were born, we got these mailers um, and we I, it must've just, you know, I, I don't remember how we got on this mailing list, but we would get these things in the mail every couple of months and it said, by this age, you know, by this time you're, you know, you're, and it would, they would be timed like a, like a, like a, like almost oh, yeah. like a, like a email campaign sequence or something mm-hmm. like that. So like such that like every couple of months it would be like, these are the things your kids should be doing, you know? Right. And, and it was in addition to communication, it was also, you know, kind of gross motor stuff mm-hmm. and uh, all the way up until we started getting, I think we got them up until like they, they turned five. But it was also cool because it was it, it, it was just kind of like a general refresh of developmental psychology, right. and it was as, yes. as a young parent, it was like, oh wow, well that's really helpful to have this information, <laughs> and and for one right. of our kids, it flagged them for early intervention services, right. uh, which was which was uh, incredibly helpful for him as well. So mm-hmm. it was. Uh, uh, that, that was, that was really helpful. I'll try to track that down and add that to the show notes, but getting back to the, the, that book, you said language development and introduction, and it was by whom? Yes. Robert E. Owens Jr. And so when I put together my last course called the advanced language learner, which is for kids who are like a VB map two or three, they're kind of saying some things on their own. I was, I got that text out the latest edition because it really is such a wealth of information. I think when you're going through school and graduate school, the first time you're just like trying to get good grades on the test and consume all the information. Then you get out into the real world and you're actually writing somebody's IEP that, you know, the district I was in, it was going over with a fine tooth comb by advocates and lawyers and all the things. So, you know, you're just trying to do your best, but it's kind of nice to be in this position now where I can kind of reflect and be like, yeah, this is really important. And this is how you can work on this. And, you know, this is a peak in my therapy room, but it kind of gives you good information about that typical language development that we just don't always have a course on that, you know, as BCBAs. I mean, I necessarily, I didn't. So. Great. Great. And just uh, for the listener, 
you know, if you're in the car, if you're, you know, walking your dog or whatever, as I always like to say, the, uh, I, I will track these resources down and have them in the show notes. So just go to behavioralobservations.com uh, or you can hop on the mailing list, which you'll get the show notes for the episodes sent directly to your email box within a few days of the show going live. So, uh, so again, just want to let folks know that uh, I'll have these resources waiting for them on the uh, website there. So, uh, yeah, so that's great to know. Um, yeah, I might have to look that one up. That's pretty cool. <laughs> uh, I, I know I'm skipping around here a little bit, but I, I just you know a lot of t- a lot of the questions that are are, are just kind of popping in uh, as as we're, as we're chatting here. I I, and I hate to keep going back and forth oh, timeline okay. wise, but there's something I just I was just having this conversation with someone else uh, about the training and behavior analysis uh, and how that differs that um, as it relates to what training is like. Uh, in other professions. So mm-hmm. uh, can you talk to me like about the, when you were in school for, to be a speech therapist in, in, in your grad program, um, if you don't mind, to the extent to which there are differences, I, I, I would be curious to see what the, you know, kind of compare contrast would be or more so the contrast, I suppose, as yeah. it relates to the type of uh, preparation uh, that, that you have. Cause I'm always curious, you know, I'm, you know, I've been a behavior analyst for quite some time, uh, and at the same time, still marveling at the the youth of of <laughs> of the field as mm-hmm. as its own standalone profession. Yeah, uh, and it's I, I always find it helpful to kind of see what other groups do. So, yeah, um, can you talk to me a little bit about what supervision is like, and what you know how, oh, how yeah. does it, how does it relate in terms of t- to what's going on in behavior analysis and yeah and uh, to the also if you could if uh, I don't I know they do this in other professions but uh, do you guys did you guys do like clinical rotations in different practice yes. areas yeah yeah right. yeah so what just like really quickly in your undergrad you know it was communication disorders so you're learning about the speech and hearing mechanism you're learning about the hearing mechanism like anatomy of the ear okay mm-hmm. like really weird stuff then when you get your masters you're deciding do i want to be an audiologist or do i want to be a speech language pathologist and so i went the speech language pathologist route and so what i think i learned a lot in my graduate coursework versus the bcba i feel like in you're learning about how to really do therapy. So you're learning about taking language samples and you're listening to a kid who maybe is hard to understand and you're determining why is he hard to understand and you're planning goals for that student. And then you're also in your master's program, you are observing other speech therapists doing therapy. So you have to get all these observation hours. Then you have to do these, like you're saying, these clinical rotations. So I worked a semester in a school with a school-based SLP, which that was amazing. This lady was not a BCBA, but she was very structured and very organized. I'm sure we would all appreciate that. And she had some really heavy hitters that had high support needs or autistic. And I love seeing all the kids, but when I got to go see some of the kids from the one classroom, I really, really loved that because I was applying and I knew that that was what I wanted to do. Um, And then I did work with adults because that is definitely within our scope. And so I think that's something too that is hard for BCBAs to understand if they're working with a speech therapist and it seems like they're not sure how to work with an autistic learner. You may A speech therapist may have never really worked with an autistic learner. And I know that that's hard for people to understand, but it really just depends on what were your clinical opportunities and what choices you made if you work in a school district and maybe it's small and there's not a lot of kids who engage, like you said, in problem behavior for you, that's an everyday occurrence. It might be really jarring for them. Um, And so I think in my graduate coursework, I really did learn a lot about how to apply these actual strategies to therapy. Then you start doing therapy and you have a supervisor and they give you feedback. It's, you know, some supervisors are like, oh yeah, that's great. That's awesome. You know, I wanted somebody to be like, no, wrong. You know what I mean? Like I'm always wanting to get better. Like that's just kind of how I am. I like critical feedback, Um, but be kind if you're sending me an Instagram DM or something. So I'm I'm fragile. Um, So I think that's kind of the difference where I think my other coursework was, I, I did have the supervision piece with Kelly, which was super helpful and got to go and talk with her about real life cases, but they're just set up a little bit differently. And then your first year As a speech language pathologist, you're getting paid as a regular job. You know, you're starting a salary, um, but it's called your CFY, your clinical fellowship year. So 
you have to have a supervisor. You have to have a mentor. And through ASHA, that national organization, you have to do different requirements. Now, you know, you might get a CFY supervisor that's not present, that's not great, that's not amazing, but you might get one that's really stellar. So it's great that we have some more embedded supports, I feel like, for people that are new to the field. I know that we're getting that in the BCBA world world and things like that. Like you can't supervise, right? Unless you've been out in the field for a while. I mean, some of these things are going to happen and grow as our profession is, is just growing at such a high rate. I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That, that, that's, that's helpful. Um, I I have a friend of mine who um, went to med school and he talked about how he did these various rotations in, in, in residency you know, and uh, it's a topic we've talked about in the past on the on the podcast as well. Mm-hmm. And I just think, um, as as the field matures, it would be nice to to solidify those opportunities so yeah. that those those uh, people get exposed to various practice areas, um, but also have a little bit more uh, structured supervision and support before you know being you know uh, let out in the great <laughs> wide open. Um, so exactly. Um, Anyway, I, I appreciate that little digression mm-hmm. there, but it's, yeah. it's it's fascinating. And again, I just think it's helpful for those of us who think about the field more broadly to have some exposure to how other more established fields prepare and support their their practitioners. So, one of the things we were, when we were chatting about doing this show, uh, I one of the areas I was curious about is uh, you know what what are some things that. Uh, uh, that that you see behavior analysts you know struggle with uh, perhaps conceptually or or just technically and things like that and mm-hmm. and so one of the areas you wanted to bring up was teaching joint attention so uh, yeah. l- l- let's get into that a little bit so uh, and this is an area I am uh, I I know uh, not a ton about or okay. I haven't really spent as much time on as other areas so I, I am I'm going to be the, uh, the uh, you know coming at this, uh, ho- hoping to l- learn quite a bit as well as uh, anyone else listening in the audience. So t- tell me a little bit about, you know, and, and for those who are, who may be listening, who are new to behavior analysis, we have a lot of students who listen, you know, uh, if you can just kind of give a description of it, but yeah. also tell about your, tell us about a little bit about how your approach to teaching joint attention is, and perhaps some of the challenges that you've seen us BCBAs make when we, we try to tackle this. Absolutely. And something that was really inspiring a couple months ago, maybe two months ago, I did a talk for BDS all about joint attention. It was an ACE course and there were a thousand people who registered 300 joined live at a lunch hour webinar. So thank you. If you were one of them, I'm actually doing some consulting in Washington state because I'm licensed there as well. And somebody saw my harp and the supervisor said, oh my gosh, did you just do a a talk for BDS about joint attention? And I, I said, yeah, for those of you listening, I have a harp behind me. So kind of random, my, my unique little talent there, Uh, but joint attention involves shared attention between at least two people on an object or event with both people knowing their attending to the same entity. And if you can think back to your kids growing up, Matt, I think you have three kids just like I do. This happens a lot. And this is actually something that is acquired very early by by typical language learners. And so, you know, your kids may bring you something or maybe you bring something to your child and you both look at it and it's unfamiliar. Or they laugh and they giggle. And if you can think of so many students that you have that are not engaging in that way, it's just this idea of What I try to talk about, especially with parents too, is is shared attention, a shared activity. I think that's like from a holistic standpoint, there's definitely a lot of good journal articles that talk about, you know, there's ways to um, respond to a bid for joint attention or initiate joint attention. But what I think we need to do as a field is think about how important it is to work on this social reciprocity, this back and forth, we're doing something together. And that the way that I try to talk about it is using books, play, and music to do that. And, you know, I have a client, I see a handful of clients here in my hometown. And I had a student who was three, he wasn't speaking. I was going into the home. When I would come to the door, he had a little car, would not look at me at all. And I was going in and doing my SLP BCBA things, which is a mix of natural environment, a little bit at the table. And the parents said, 
you know, the other speech therapist sits him in a high chair and straps him in so he doesn't run around because he was that kind of kid that had a very short attention span. He didn't engage. Now, 23 year old me would have been like, okay, where are the flashcards I need to do all discrete trial? You know, I'm doing something wrong. But 43 year old me, now I say I'm seasoned. I don't like to use the world old, but I'm seasoned. I felt more comfortable to provide coaching to the parent about what joint attention is why it's so very important. And the way that I try to talk about it, and I actually have a free 30-minute training. I can give you the link for that too. That's geared towards parent and staff training is that these things are more natural environments. So I have found that it's hard sometimes for me as a speech therapist to train other staff on how to do these things. I always try to use behavioral skills training where I'm modeling and I'm showing, but I think sometimes we don't always feel really comfortable with this type of instruction. And so then if we're trying to convey that to somebody else, it can feel a little bit, you know, hard to convey. Um, But yeah, this idea of using, you know, like a book I love to use is Pete the Cat. You know, that's a super engaging Mm. book and we're just having fun. You know, like where 23-year-old me might've been like, okay, time to read a story, time to sit. You know, we're going to do work. I might've said something like that. Now I'm just like, okay, we're going to do a story. This is going to be great. So with that same student, A year ago, I tried to do Pete the Cat and he followed along for 30 seconds and then he was gone. You know, I'm seeing him in his home. If you've ever done home-based therapy, Mm -hmm. it's a challenge, you know, it's a challenge, right? But now a year later, he is coming over, he's picking a book, he's doing intraverbals from the book, answering questions. It's just amazing to see the growth. But I really had to advocate and talk with the parents about what is joint attention, why is it so very important? And these are the ways that I'm working on it. You know, another song I really love is Wheels on the Bus because you have all the motion. So we're working on imitation in a very fun way. So instead of sitting at the table and saying, do this one and clapping hands, we're doing a song and it's fun and it's social because we know that that's the cornerstone of so much more advanced communication, that it all starts here. And so I think having a focus on that and feeling comfortable with doing some of these things as the BCBA to then talk to RBTs and parent training and all those times where we get to talk to people that may be with the kids more is really, really important because this really does need to be incorporated into our sessions. I see. I see. So uh, what was the... Uh, what was the recipe for getting this kid to focus less on his his uh his toy and 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 more on on you in the book is it and yeah you know, the, that's that's a good question charisma <laughs> you know uh, uh, how, how did how did, you, how did you manage to pull that off Yes, I do try to be charismatic during my sessions. If a kid likes that, I'd say out of 20 years, I had one kid that was did not like that at all. So I read the room and, you know, it's not my energetic self. But yeah, I mean, always focusing on, you know, I start my sessions with something fun. Just, oh, here we have toys. This is, you can play with these. Then I start in, old me would have started then in on manding, a manding session. I do manding within my sessions, but not in that frame. So for me, it's the framework is, okay, this is something fun. Hey, how's it going? Then we start working on joint attention to build that rapport, to have a shared activity, and really trying to train the parents on understanding that this is, we can't make our kids communicate. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. So they, they drop the other speech therapist, the other speech therapist who strapped the kid in, in the high chair was dropped from the services. This child does also get ABA. I am, I'm in this area, right? I live in Cleveland, Ohio. I've been here about 20 years. So I know the BCBA. So we have a good relationship together. And so that combination, he also goes to preschool two days a week. So he has robust services we're all on the same page, but I think us having that dialogue, but it's been amazing. Another thing, you know, he would come to the room or the door with the the car in his hand and not look at me. And so using a car in a car track is another super fun way that we can use play and toys for joint attention in our sessions. But we just, it probably took a year. Now he can, I can zoom a little car over the coffee table at the house. He picks it up and then he puts it down the car track. But it's been all this systematic instruction that he's had. And I think, you know, I've built a rapport with him. I think he likes me. He's excited to see like what I'm going to bring that day. And it's been amazing to see that type of growth because 23-year-old me, when I first started, would have thought I'm doing something wrong. 
I need to do everything at the table. I need to say, okay, time to sit. It's time for work. But I'm like, no, that's not, you know, now that I'm older, I can say, I feel more confident to say, that's not, that's not how it works. I can't make your child engage with me. I have to make them motivated to do so. And and that takes time. And sometimes the parents will say like, well, how, how do you know to do that? Or, you know what I mean? So it, it's fun to be able to, to be in this area where I feel comfortable sharing and to be able to work with this handful of clients that I still see here in my hometown, because I feel like part of me should give that up for my life work balance, but, <laughs> but I get a lot of joy out of it. So. You know, balancing work and life can be difficult, and that's why the University of Cincinnati Online designed a Master's of Education program in behavior analysis that is 100% online and asynchronous, which means that you can log on when it works for you. UC's student success coordinators will work with you from start all the way until graduation to ensure that you are receiving the support you need. Graduate in as few as five semesters from a top 10 program in total number of graduates and prepare for the BCBA exam. The program is FAFSA eligible, and the University of Cincinnati also offers a business partnership program to offer tuition discounts to eligible employees. If you want to learn more, go to online.uc.edu and click the request info button. You know, sometimes, you know, I'm trying to explain something to like my kids or whatever, you know, like two of them are, you know, one of them has their driver's license and one of them, you know, is learning how to drive and you know, so I, I've, I've kind of used the analogy, you need to learn the rules to break you know, in order to know which ones <laughs> to break or, or, or modify, I suppose, might be the more appropriate lesson yeah. in the context of driving. But did you, did you think you needed to go through that 23-year-old me? Like, I've got to get, I'm going to do my 10 trials of man, so I'm going to right. flip the page. I'm going to do my 10 trials of, you know... Of, of 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 listener responses and mm-hmm. you know I, i'm i'm m- maybe reading too much into this but i don't know like you know the, the, I, i'm just thinking about like the development of someone's repertoire over over a uh, you know over years i i could because to be able to teach in that fluid way that you described mm-hmm. as your as your current self uh it, you know probably takes the stacking of a number of different skill, mm-hmm. you know repertoires on top of one yeah. another that were you know i i, I don't know did, did you ever reflect on that i mean i know it sounds yeah. like you're reflecting already obviously <laughs> as, as what you would do uh-huh. for now versus then but i i'm just I, again i've some I, maybe i'm hyper focusing on on on, <laughs> on de- you know training and development and and where we are as, as a field so it's on my mind a lot these days so you know yeah no um, it's a great question because i remember being 23 working at the cleveland clinic going to my supervisor because i had an outpatient who would cry w- during our sessions and would run around the table would not engage and i remember feeling very defeated. And I'm the type of person that I want to find out now how to help somebody or how to fix a problem. And I'm going to go all in and do it. And I felt really defeated. I remember going to my supervisor and saying like, I need help. I I don't know how to reach this student. And they were little, they weren't engaging in problem behavior, but they weren't engaging with me. They didn't like any of the therapy session that I had planned. And my supervisor just said, you know, you're doing great. Like, keep at it. They're going to start talking soon. And I just left that meeting feeling like I had way more questions and there were no answers. It's almost like now there's too many answers. There's a podcast. There's a million different ways to approach it. And that's why I love being really organized and offering my ACE and ASHA courses to be like, no, this is how we do it. Do you want to see? Because I really do think therapy and, and the therapy that we're all planning as BCBAs and intervention, it is science but it is also an art form. And when I have a really good therapy session afterwards, I'll, you know, I'll make a TikTok about it. I'll make an Instagram story about it. I talk about it on a podcast and things like that. I like to share. But I do think that I am constantly learning. And as professionals, we have to have that love and that joy for learning. And we all know clients that have made us think outside of the box. Like we might just have that one client, but we're thinking about that client all the time. You know, like I had a girl that I worked with at a non-public program who was completely conversational, but engaged in very unsafe problem behavior and would just stop talking and things. But I thought about how to program for her hour of speech all the time. And when I was able to reach that student, it brought me a lot of joy. And I love being able to model that for other people too. I think we just actually have to always be problem solving, which I think most people that are listening are filled with joy and passion and want to help their their students to the best of their abilities. But absolutely, this has been 
a journey for me in learning how to really help my clients in such a specific way. And that's why I love being able to offer these courses. And I'm sure, you know, with you disseminating on your podcast, it's just amazing to be able to share that way. Because back in the day when we were starting out, it, there was nothing, there was nothing out there. Now there's too much and it's hard to decide what to listen to. But uh, back in the day, there was nothing. There was nothing for us to, to hold on to and run with. Yeah, it is an embarrassment of riches, I suppose, at this this point in time. Yeah. But uh, that's okay. I, as, you know, it probably beats the alternative. But uh, so uh, I, I I do want to talk about your podcast. Uh, it's the uh, the Autism Outreach Podcast. It is, yes. Uh, and it is uh, been wildly successful. So <laughs> I, I I want to, um, well. You know, obviously, I know the work that goes into creating and putting out a podcast. Um, and I know you've got uh, a, a busy family life, and you you still see clients and things like that. You have all these professional development endeavors that you've talked about and whatnot. So, what what made you want to say, "Hey, I, I should do a podcast on top of all this, uh, all, all these other things"? So, what what made you want to undertake this project? Yeah. I mean, it really goes back to that 18-year-old client. When I first learned about the science of ABA, I remember sitting with my coworkers and saying, I want to go places and I want to talk about ABA. And what's so cool is I'm getting that opportunity to do that weekly on the Autism Outreach Podcast, where I talk about autism and communication. And you know what had happened? There are not a lot of speech therapy podcasts. And I had been a guest on most of the big ones at this point when I started thinking about doing my own. And I started thinking about who I wanted to have on my podcast and obviously how I wanted it to be more behaviorally oriented and things like that. So I took a course from my business mentor, Pat Flynn, called Power Up Podcasting. And I'll never forget, my kids had a snow day. And so I taped my first episode in my walk-in closet ahead of schedule, which was super exciting. But I felt extremely nervous, probably more nervous than I would if I was standing in front of a large group of people or doing a live webinar, whatever it is. And I pressed record and... We're almost, we're three episodes away from taping the hundredth episode, wow. which just, I know it's so amazing. And I always say, you know, when you have a podcast, you really bond with your, the people that you have on. It's just so cool to be able to connect with people that way and to be able to share their story. And I love being able to curate that, that guest list of who is on my podcast and to be able to share it. So anytime somebody messages me or emails me and says, this was helpful, like this was really great information. That is what keeps me going. And and honestly, I just love talking. I was always the kid that got in trouble for sitting sideways in their chair. I'd have like an A4 for citizenship though, because I was like always talking to somebody. So it's just kind of in my nature. But I, I love the idea to disseminate and to share. And especially with the climate right now of applied behavior analysis and how it's getting kind of scrutinized. I think that dissemination every single day is really, really important. I was thinking... Um, before I logged on today about this episode you had with Pat Fryman and how he talked about is one of your really early episodes. He talked about public speaking mm. and he's such a good speaker. I remember watching, I've never heard him talk live, but I, I watched a presentation he gave and it was a keynote and I was like crying in my, in my classroom office, which is, is rare. And I was so moved by it. But what he talked about in the episode with you is you got to get out there. You know, we have to talk about the science in a positive way. We have to share these stories because people really need to understand how very transformational it can be. Yeah, that one was uh that, that yeah, that show I will uh I'll get a link to that show in the show notes, but yeah, Pat obviously is uh you know, just uh just probably the best speaker we have in the field right now uh and has just own that space for for mm -hmm. so long he's really 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 good and we have some other excellent science communicators that are that are that are uh i think uh coming up as well uh that uh yeah but yeah learning how to present is uh certainly important um but anyway but yeah i i wow 100 episodes that's that's amazing that's so congratulations <laughs> thank you um uh, is, is there a a um uh, is there a particular episode or two that that you think you'd like the uh, you'd like to direct the attention of the audience towards? Yeah, absolutely. Episode fifty eight I did with Jared Stewart. Jared Stewart is an autistic adult, but he is also a BCBA. 
And he has a really amazing journey, his own journey. He grew up in a very, very small town called Kodiak, Alaska, and he did not have a pleasant go of it with school. At one time, he was actually, he did homeschooling for a year and things like that, but he was able to get out of Alaska, which was not a positive place for him. He went on and he got his master's. He's a BCBA. He's married and has a family. And he works in this really amazing place. I think it's in Utah where he is working with autistic adults who are on the cusp of being independent, either Mm -hmm. going to college or being independent adults living on their own. And they focus just on that type of um, person. And he's doing really, really great work. So I think that is a really good one because on my podcast, I really try to have autistic adults on to talk about their journeys or autistic families to talk about the journey through autism. Um, The other one is episode 62. And that's just where I go into greater detail all about joint attention. So if that's something that you want to learn more about or use as a training for staff, that is definitely a good one because I go greater in depth in that topic. Excellent. Excellent. Definitely going to check out that uh, Jared Stewart one. I, uh, I, 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 that sounds, sounds like it's really something. So, Mm -hmm. uh, and and you mentioned Pat Flynn, uh, I, I, you know, kind of quite casually, but uh, (laughs) for those who aren't in the, uh, the kind of online, um, I guess uh, on you know uh, marketing space. Pat Flynn is an absolute legend, and, and, <laughs> and uh, is uh, um, uh, so yeah. Uh, and, and you were on his show, where did you I were you was? His, yeah, this was the highlight of my life. So he does. He has a, a professional person who does a little bit about the the presenter, the speaker that day. And so I've been listening to that for five years, ever since I was driving to and fro at work, thinking about my little nagging voice that I should have my own business. And they did that. And it was all about me and Akron. And I think LeBron James was in there because he's from my hometown. And I, I was like, oh my goodness, but nobody gets it. I know you were in his membership for a while, but you know, if you're not in the online space, you don't get how huge that was. But thanks for bringing that up because that was a life highlight for sure for me yeah, to be yeah. on there. Yeah, it's kind of like playing. It would be like the opportunity to play pickup basketball with you know one of the greats or... <laughs> <Right>. you know, <laughs> You know, cool. throw, throw the football around with Tom Brady or something. Mm-hmm. Like. It's it's like that level of uh, yeah. in the world of podcasting. He is, you know, he is the Pat Fryman. He's the <laughs> he's it. He is, he's you know all all the things. So uh, mm-hmm. anyway, um, wow. Um, this has been uh, I I think this hour has just flown right by, Rose. So it's been it's been great fun chatting with you here. I, I'd like I'd like to uh, um. I give you the last word here. So if you yeah. could just take us out for uh, with uh, what advice you might have for uh, the newly minted BCBA, or as I'm kind of expanding the question as of late, like BCBAs of any, at any experience level, you know, so if you had the, uh, you know, the, the, the soapbox to hop up on, what, you know, what, what would you say? Yeah, I would just tell everybody to take a deep breath and know that you can't be the master of everything. You can't know how to help a student who has a limited diet and a student who has problem behavior and all toileting issues. You really just need to find a mentor, especially if you're new in the field, to make sure that you're helping your students. I think that sometimes especially if you're maybe a a school-based BCBA and you're the only one in a district or you're strapped really thin for time, you're feeling so isolated. And how we were saying, there's just a plethora of services and ways to get involved. Find a mentor either in real life or, you know, on Instagram. I've never met you, Matt, before, but we've talked on the phone and, you know, talked about different things. I have a lot of people that I may have never met in real life, but I I talk to on Instagram or Facebook message or text, and that helps me feel connected to somebody professionally. And I think if you're feeling isolated, making sure that you have a mentor is a really great idea because being a BCBA is really overwhelming. It's very rewarding, but other people that are not BCBAs, they don't get it. And so you need to find, you need to find your people and find a mentor is, is, is what I would say. Awesome. Awesome. That's great advice. So people can find you at abaspeech.com. abaspeech.org. So oh, org. excuse yes, me. Okay. That's thank okay. You. Yeah. abaspeech.org. Um, and if you want to hit me up on Instagram, 
ABA Speech by Rose. I'm also on TikTok. So show me some love over there. There's actually tons of BCBAs and RBTs and things over on TikTok. So I think because it's like a younger person's platform, I just did a live with Dr. Mary Barbera and we were only going to do a half hour and we ended up staying an hour because there were so many people. So I, uh, on I TikTok? make funny, what I think is funny content about ABA. I and, see. Yeah. I see. I, I, uh, uh, I haven't dipped my toe in the TikTok <laughs> waters yet. So I, I feel like, uh, well, anyway, I'll, I'll sp- spare the audience, but you know, my old man yelling at clouds point of view on TikTok. <laughs> I watch reels like a grown up, as the saying goes. Yeah. <laughs> you go. just old, uh, old TikTok. That's, that's okay. Right. That's it's right. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Uh, um, and then there's the uh, Autism Outreach Podcast, which I'm yes. assuming you can get on any uh, platform. Yes. podcast platform you like. So Absolutely. Um, again, folks, I'll have links to all this stuff in the show notes. So just go to behavioralobservations.com and uh, we'll have all that information there. So uh, Rose, this has been a really fun conversation. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at Behavior Podcast.